here. <laughs> I, I traveled uh, 10 kilometers uh, from, my, <laughs> from my home to, to give you this talk. And there's a title, I think, in the program. It's, uh, it's a wrong title, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and, but it's a nice conference. I mean, it's a very nice ambience in the hotel. I've never been here before. Uh, so I'll be talking today about uh, algorithmic approach to quantum contextuality. And thank you guys for pairing with Adam, because uh, I guess there'll be some overlap between what we, what we talk about, uh, I hope. Uh, OK, so let me start. So uh, uh, there's the outline of my talk. Uh, so first I will, well, I'm not sure how many people here know about quantum contextuality, so I will just kind of explain this in a brief way, the way I understand it, right? You can argue with me if, if it's not correct. <laughs> uh, then I will uh, say a few remarks about algorithmic entropy. And this point uh, sends chills down my spine because here in the room, I think there's Professor Crutchfield, and he has this in his little pinky, right? And I struggle with this notion, so I apologize if I say something stupid, right? You can... Forgive it. <laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> I can oh, move on now. <laughs> no, but please, if I say something imprecise, please, I mean, you know, I mean, let me know how silly I am. Uh, and then I will show you how to use uh, algorithmic entropy to talk something about, to, take, to, to, to say something about <coughs> quantum contextuality. Okay? Uh, and then uh, there will be some final remarks and, and some open problems that interest me, and maybe you have also interest in that. But no, this is the, f so I'm going to talk about uh, quantum contextuality, and I see some young faces in the audience here. So I will want to show you something, what awaits you if you go into this topic, right? And this is a short clip. <laughs> <coughs> All right, which is, uh, it's, a, it's a longer movie, but I will show you like 30 seconds, oh, which is the, <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe it'll be more interesting than my talk, for sure. Uh, so, so I will introduce you to the situation. So this is a toilet, because you don't see the beginning, right? And uh, you have two prominent quantum physicists, uh, which is Chas of Bruckner, okay? A typical, you know, uh, shape. And uh, uh, Borivoy Dakic, you probably know him too. If not, you should. And that's the master of them all. <laughs> yeah, it's a Serbian movie, actually. All of them are Serbs, I, I just realized, okay? And uh, <clears throat> so basically, these two guys have a uh, discussion in toilet, right, uh, about interpretations of quantum mechanics, okay? And uh, the other guy, the cowboy, comes out from the cubicle behind them, okay? And that's what happens after he listens to their conversation, okay? So let me play it. Let's ask this cowboy. What do you think about that? <laughs> Just shut up and come to me. <laughs> so I really do not... <laughs> Dev squad, I, I really don't recommend you to go into this topic, right? Maybe Adam <laughs> will tell you something else, right? But uh, it's a very interesting topic, but you know, it has consequences on your life and, and academic career. Maybe not that dire, but uh, okay. So let me get to the meat of my talk. So uh, yeah, quantum contextuality. So I will just explain this as I see it. Okay. So you know, this is a very simple thing, in fact. So you have some uh, physical system, right? And you can ask some questions, right? A, B, C, or m more questions. Uh, you know, what is the momentum of the particle? What is the position and stuff like that? And then you get answers, right? Uh, all right, and uh, this system is, is called non-contextual if you can assign the, uh, the, the answers to all these questions uh, at the same time, okay? So that the answers exist at the same time, and uh, that's, not obvious, right? Um, because in quantum mechanics, uh, sometimes you can only ask questions uh, that are compatible. So uh, in quantum mechanics, this would be that A comm commutes with B, and only then you can uh, measure them together. And therefore, the physical questions you ask uh, can be asked only, let's say, in pairs, right? So you can ask A and B and uh, A and C, OK, at the same time. But you cannot ask A, B, C at the same time because they do not commute. Okay. Actually, in quantum mechanics, it's not possible. You need more questions to have this, but it's just an example. 
And uh, as Coach and, and Specker and Bell himself showed, uh, because of this non-commutativity in quantum mechanics, then you cannot have uh, simultaneous answers to all the questions, okay? They depend basically on the context. So if you, if you measure A in the context of B, then you, can, you, you will have different results that if you measure A with the context of, uh, of C, okay? Now the proof of Coach and Specker and Bell these are the proofs that are on the piece of paper, right? So basically they, uh, they tell you that the structure of quantum mechanics tells you that you cannot, <coughs> you cannot assign the values to these uh, questions, the answers, okay? But these are things that are not testable in the laboratory, okay? So the, but there's a way to, to test something uh, similar. So basically now you know that quantum mechanics is a probabilistic nature, therefore you have some probabilities of getting outcomes. And if you have well defined answers to all the questions, then now you can assume that uh, because of randomness that is na in nature, you can assign uh, a well defined probability measure, okay? So you have a joint probability distribution for all the questions you can ask. Uh, but uh, again, in quantum mechanics, you know, you can get only pairs, all right? So therefore you only can measure in, in, in reality what is accessible to you are these probabilities of, of the pairs distributions, right? They're called marginals. And then, but again, you ask whether these marginals that you can obtain in the experiment, whether they actually can be derived from bigger probability distribution, okay? And this is testable, okay? Uh, this approach, you can go to the lab and do experiments and they, they've been done before many times at nauseam, okay? Uh, don't know why people do them anymore again, <coughs> but yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, well, this is the, uh, if you have a system that is spin one particle and you have uh, five projectors such that they pairwise commute, so these lines here mean they commute, so A, a commutes with B, so you can ask the question about A and B in the lab. And then you ask whether there is such a joint probability distribution and the experiments have been done, you can derive some inequalities and they tell you that no, you cannot, okay? But again, it's a test about, so if you, uh, if you do not have this, right, then uh, as I see it, you, you impose some additional thing on, 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 on your questions, right, which is that there is some probability measure, okay? But uh, as I would tell you, I would like to argue that you don't need this, okay? That you don't need to talk about probabilities when you talk about quantum mechanics, okay? Because uh, in the end, in quantum mechanics, what you get are the outcomes of measurements and uh, they can be always binary outcomes if you, if you wish. Okay, so when you do some measurement in the lab, you get 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, okay, and that's all. And that you later calculate frequencies, it's just your choice, okay, because it's convenient and it works, of course, and, and it, it, it's very precise and you know all of that, okay, but it's additional assumption, I, I would say. I would argue that you need to have probability measure. All right, then another test. So this was the test on a single system, which is controversial, by the way, because uh, uh, Adam, I guess, will be talking about it, right? About the issues that arise from testing uh, non-contextual hidden variables on, 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 yeah, on, on. So Adam will do a much better job than me exp explaining this. But there's a famous test when you, you can do the same test when you separate the systems and you have some they're spatially separated. And then you can perform two non-compatible measurements, A, a and A prime, B and B prime, and then you get the marginals and you ask whether there's such a joint probability distribution and then the answer is no, experiments have been done, there is no such a thing. Okay, so quantum mechanics is in this sense uh, contextual, okay? On, or maybe more precise, it cannot be described by the probabilistic non-contextual hidden variables. Uh, it is experimental because as I said, on the piece of paper you have a GZ paradox that tells you that there are no, no, uh, no non-contextual hidden variables, right? So that's, that's clear. <coughs> okay, now comes the, the scary part. <laughs> so I'll say a few things about algorithmic entropy for those, of, for those of you who don't know. I don't know myself much about it, but uh, yeah, I understand something at least. Mm, okay. So what it is, right? So what is algorithmic entropy? By the way, uh, in the talk in the morning, uh, one of the guys mentioned that uh, this is called sometimes Komogorov entropy or Komogorov complexity, but I had a coffee with 
Vladko and uh, Gregory Chaitin. <laughs> and uh, at that time, Vladko did not have a gun with him. Okay, uh, there was uh, luckily, right? And Greg, no, no, he had a machete. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and I mentioned, oh, you know, I have some cool results about Komogorov entropy. And he said, what? What did you say? <laughs> I said, come on, entropy. No, I mean, there's no such a thing, right? I mean, what do you mean? I spent my whole life, you know, doing this, and uh, come on, did very little, you know, I did more, and then I said, okay, so how should I call it? Oh, algorithmic entropy. And once I did it, we are best friends, actually. I mean, <laughs> uh, he's right, of course. I mean, I think he has the right to say that. Okay, so uh, what is algorithmic entropy, right? Uh, uh, complexity. So basically, you have a universal Turing machine, okay, and then you can input some. Uh, and you have some binary string, right? Let's call it S, okay? That are given to you. And now we're asking the question, right? What is the shortest possible program on this universal Turing machine? Uh, let's call it S star that will give you uh, this bit string S, okay? Ma ma but it must be the shortest program, okay? The shortest possible. And then algorithmic entropy of this bit string, okay? Is the length in bits of this shortest program, okay? So that's a very simple definition. OK? And now, this is a very strange thing, right? At least to me, because uh, once I tried to understand it, I b bought the book, but it was that thick. After five pages, I gave up. So, and then all the knowledge I took from the internet, OK? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, OK, but few. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, hey. I mean. <laughs> so, um, everybody knows I'm a clown, anyway, so. Uh, but examples, right? Let's say that I give you the string of million zeros, OK? And then, of course, uh, one of the programs, uh, maybe not the shortest one, but very short, right, is we just print this million zeros, right? And machine will print it, and, and that's it, right? So it's a very short program, okay? It does not depend on, on, on the length of the string, right, that you want to produce. It just depends on the implementation of the programming language that you have. And then in such situation, when this uh, algorithmic entropy is much shorter or smaller than, uh, than the string itself, then we say that this string is algorithmically simple, okay? And, uh, but now take million coin flips, okay? They are random, let's assume they are random, right? Then of course, uh, there's no program that can do this, so the only thing you can do is just to print a given random bit string, okay? And that, that's of course, as long as the string itself, the program, okay? At least as long as, as, the, as the string that you want to produce. Okay, then we, so if this is uh, comparable to the string that you want to produce, then we call, call it algorithmic, algorithmically complex. Okay, now there are some, of course, things like, uh, do you know what it is? Pa oh, wow. <laughs> I know because you saw this, right, one, one, yeah? <laughs> so this is pi, right? And it looks like a very complicated bit string, but of course, uh, there is an algorithm that can calculate it to arbitrary precision, okay? Therefore, this is algorithmi algorithmically simple. Okay, and a quick question, but not to you. <laughs> so if this, if this is the shortest program that uh, gives you uh, some, some uh, output S, right? What would be the, is it uh, this string S star, which is the shortest program giving you some string S, what would be the complexity of this? What do you think? Is it simple or complex? Let's try to find it again. Yeah, so let's say, okay. Ah, you see, I knew that you were right. <laughs> Is a puzzle. So let's say I give you a string S, right? And you found this S star, which is the shortest program that gives you the string S. So what would be the, what do you think would be the complexity of this shortest program? Same. The same, right? So it's uh, algorithmic, algorithmically complex, right? And you know, there are more surprises like that, okay? Uh, now. <coughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, of yeah. course, is contradictory, right? So it must be the, of the same length. So it's a funny quantity, and what is uh, really funny about it is that it can't really be calculated in most of the cases, right? And uh, let me try to prove it, okay? Uh, because I think when I gave this talk, so I mean, you or Vladko had some questions about it, right? So the proof is actually very simple. Uh, please correct me if the proof is wrong, <laughs> okay? But let's say you have a universal tuning machine, and uh, uh, you can execute n steps, you know? So n, n cycles of the clock, right, on, on, on the computer. And now uh, you are given the string S, okay? And of course, you can find the program that uh, just prints the string S, okay? Uh, all right? And therefore, this is my, uh, like, a benchmark, okay? 
So this is the length of, my, of, 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 of the program that prints the given string. Of course, it may not be the shortest, okay? Because if you were to print the pi, it's very long, but we know we can compress it. Okay, so this is my benchmark. And now I'm going to list all the programs shorter than this, uh, than this program, okay? And I can, you know, uh, make them, you know, like 0, 1, this is the, well, the first program, right? the second program. I can order them, okay? And of course, now for, uh, uh, if I, there are two to the power of length of this, because I list, on, I list them only until I reach this. So there's two to the power of uh, the length of SP. Possibilities, right? Possible strings, possible programs. And uh, if I run this on n, n steps on my uni universal Turing machine, then this is the time that I need. It's a large time, OK, if the string is long, but it, it is doable, right? I mean, there's nothing, no problem with that. Uh, and now, of course, you know, I, I look at the programs that halted, right? That stopped, OK? And uh, so let's say I have uh, some set of programs. Let's call them S, let's say one of them is S prime. So this is the program that halted, right? And it produced the, uh, um, I mean, the program that halted, right? And now, of course, uh, <coughs> this, this, this programs that halted, right, can, can only be those that are the shortest one if you let the n run to infinity, OK? And of course, now you could get smarter than that. And you can say, OK, I'm going to list, I'm only, going, well, I'm only going, going to take into account the programs that hold, OK, and only check them. But of course, you, you know that you can't decide whether a given program holds or not, OK? So therefore, there's no way to actually list and find the programs that will give you the, the shortest program that will give you the given string s. OK? I saw Gregory Chaitin giving some much simpler proof, OK, than that, but I forgot. It was too smart, OK? Short program. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe he is himself the shortest program. Uh, but nevertheless, OK, uh, this quantity is useful, and then you can play with it, right? So for instance, you can, uh, I will just show you things that I need for the rest of the talk, right? So for instance, you can define, you know, like, uh, uh, conditional algorithmic uh, entropy, right? So let's say you want to produce a uh, given string S when you have a string T, okay? Then you can calculate KS given T, okay? And this looks like a conditional uh, entropy, right? Uh, but there are some surprises there. So for instance, uh, if, if without this red thing, this is what you would have if you put K as H, which is the Shannon entropy, okay? But here, uh, nope, you don't have this identity. You have some logarithmic corrections, OK? And uh, I want to highlight this because uh, it will, it's, it, it's important that you know that for the rest of, of my talk, OK? But now, uh, having this, uh, you can introduce a very interesting quantity that was, I, I, I believe, OK? It was first introduced by Zurek in some nature paper from, no, OK? Who said no? Oh, yeah, okay. So uh, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, basically, if you add this to, uh, let's call them entropies, okay? Then it's, it's, it's a distance measure, okay? Uh, a mathematical proper distance measure is symmetric, is positive, okay? And it measures the distance between arbitrary bit strings, okay? It's quite interesting. You don't care where they come from, all right? But you can calculate the distance. Uh, and you know uh, you can see it's symmetric. You can see it's non-negative, right? You can very easily prove that uh, it also obeys triangle inequality. So uh, that will be triangle inequality, okay? Uh, that means uh, uh, less or s no, less or equal. <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't have uh, tech. And basically, this holds because you know if you want to produce a string u from s, right? Then you go uh, around by producing string t. Of course, it will be only longer, I right? cannot be shorter, okay? So it's very simple. So uh, you have triangle inequality. And this proves that this is a distance measure. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. This, everything is up to this logarithmic corrections, right? Unfortunately, but, uh, but now you can introduce uh, uh, another distance measure, right? Which is called uh, normalized uh, information distance, okay? And I'll be using this measure, okay? So uh, basically, it's defined as you take the, well, you see how it is defined. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to describe it, right? But you just take the uh, joint uh, uh, algorithmic entropy 
of S and T, you subtract the min minimum, minimum of the separate entropies and divide by maximum. And this is a distance, okay? Also, you can prove that uh, it's a proper mathematical distance. And then having this distance, right, uh, using, you know, simple algebraic exercise, uh, you can uh, find uh, like a, a rectangle inequality, okay? Right now, uh, right, so this is the consequence of the triangle inequality for this one. And you can go to, I will need it later, you can go to more complicated shapes, right? So uh, instead of rectangle, you can have a octa no, what is the next? Pentagon? Oct Pentagon. Satanic symbol, okay. All right, now, uh, because, you know, Ks cannot be calculated, right? You don't know what it is. You can only estimate it. So one of the good estimates is just when you use a, like a normal real-life compressor, like gzip or whatever you use, okay? Uh, then you can uh, estimate this from above. And that's what, I'm what I need, okay? It's a very simple thing. And of course, intuitively, it is clear, right? That because this is like an ultimate compression, right? I mean, this is the, the best you can do by definition. This one is, of course, full of you know, assumptions, and it's always worse, OK? And of course, then if you replace, now we can also, it can be proved that if you replace this k by c and you introduce normalized compression distance, it's also a distance, OK? Well, there are some assumptions about these compressors, right? Uh, but I'm not going to go into details because it's ir irrelevant. OK, I just want to give you the gist. OK, so that's the end of the remarks. I went through with only one uh, objection. <laughs> oh, yeah, just too kind. Uh, so now let me use this algorithmic entropy. How much time do I have? You still have 20, I think. OK, so I'll be very fast, yeah. Yeah, you've got like 25 minutes. Yeah, because Adam is, when Adam starts talking, he can never stop, right? So, <laughs> so I will give you this, <laughs> which is good, because I like your talks. All right, so, uh, so let me try to show you that I can use these concepts of uh, algorithmic entropy to show you that we, you can have a, a contextuality test, OK? All right, so, so I, I don't have an example when you, can, when you have a single system, OK? I cannot use these uh, ideas to tell you that single spin one system is uh, contextual, like Coach and Sprecher showed you, or uh, Kriatsko and others also showed you. I cannot do that, OK? I don't know why. I mean, I know why, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't want to tell you now, OK? Because, uh, so let me use something that everybody should be familiar with, OK? Which is the, the kind of Bell test, all right? So now we have two parties, right, that are separated in space, OK? Full of dark ma matter and black holes and uh, stuff like that. <coughs> OK, he's not listening. That's fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> But this time, uh, so we have uh, two universal Turing machines, right, separated. And basically, I want to check, right, uh, whether uh, when I send the correlated programs to them, right, whether I can reproduce the quantum correlations that I can observe in this experiment, okay? All right, now, but for a certain reason that I will explain, I need three, uh, three measurements on each side, not two. With two, you cannot do this, okay? You need minimum three. All right. Uh, now, of course, you, uh, the quantum equivalent of this picture would be just maximally entangled state, right? That distributes the particles. And now these are qubits, let's say. Okay, I, we tested this for qubits and for singlet state. And you choose these measurement directions. So the block vectors are equidistant, right? So the angles are the same, right? And and, and the same here. And you align these uh, measurements in such a way that a the block vector corresponding to your measurement A is perpendicular to B double prime. Okay, so you can always al align them like that, right? It's, it, for, for those of you who know, it's like chain bell inequalities, okay? That's exactly the same idea here. All right? And now, of course, now I'm going to kind of <coughs> sweep under the carpet a lot of things that I can explain over coffee if you want, because they are quite, quite kind of boring and technical. But I want to be honest. So e each measurement, right, along a direction will generate string a, right? And uh, Bob, when it measures in b direction, will be string b and so on and so forth. So you can understand that. And of course, I can derive this uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, sorry, 
at six ver vertex inequality, right? So the distance of going around, it's longer than the distance when you go directly, right? This is trivial. And of course, here, I, as I said, there are many assumptions that I don't have time or even I'm not willing to discuss right now. OK, because, you know, uh, certain, yes, let's say if I measure string A with B, right? Uh, and then I measure string A, if I consider string A with B and string A prime with B, then I cannot take the same, in, in the experiment, I never have the same B, OK? Because A and A prime do not commute. So, so I assume that if I could measure, you know, A prime with B and A with B, which I can't, but if I could, then I would, right? Which is a very standard assumption in Bell inequalities. All of them have this counterfactual uh, reasoning there built in, okay? So you cannot escape, escape it. Apparently, uh, Stefan, Stefan Wolf, Wolf, sorry, Wolf, Wolf, he can do this, apparently. He can escape this counterfactual thing. But I, I, I don't believe him, and I don't know. <laughs> he gave a talk, and I switched off after 10 minutes, right? It was entertaining, but, you know. Uh, yeah. And there are some other assumptions there, okay? That uh, if you're really interested, I'll, I will tell you over coffee. And if not, then also okay with me. Okay, so as I said, right, we have this equidistance things, right? So therefore, uh, if you look at this normalized information distance, this is the distance that contains uh, algorithmic entropy inside. Then because the equidistance, right, then this uh, quantities will, will be the same. OK? Well, because physically, you know, there's no difference, right? When you have this or rotated, right? This, you, we know we get the same. So this, this is perhaps addi additional assumption, OK? Perhaps, right? I use some kind of rotational invariance or whatever. But let me use this assumption. OK? And then, oh, <coughs> all right, so I, I have these uh, things, right? They're equal. OK? And also, each individual strings, right? If this is a singlet state, uh, and this you can test experimentally. Of course, you cannot compress them in any way, right? Because they are totally random, right? Although I don't want to use the word random because I don't want to use uh, notion of probability. So basically, they are incom incompressible, OK? And of course, if you put b, b prime, b double prime is the same, OK? And now, the, now this is important, OK? That's why I cannot do this for a single system. And, and this is why I, I need a chain bell inequality type reasoning. Because now we see that A and B double prime, they are orthogonal, OK? Therefore, they will give you also incompressible results. And therefore, you have a maximal distance between the strings, which is 1. OK? All right. And now with this, all right? And I, as I said, I cannot calculate this K things. But I can estimate them from, from above, right, by, the, by some comp compression algorithm, OK? And if you look at this inequality, that's good, right? Because that's already one. So this part of the inequality, the right-hand side is, yes? But you test that in A prime as well. Yes, but not in this experiment. I'll, I'll get back to this. Yeah. Uh, which one, sorry? Uh, which I test? Well, the equal to one. I can test it, yeah. I can test it, yeah. But not with k, of course, uh, because I cannot ca calculate k. But I can do this with compressors, yeah, right? Yeah. I can have a reasonable yeah. estimate, yeah. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. You can test it. Yeah. This is testable. Yes. <clears throat> All right, so as you see, that's OK. That's already fixed. And now these quantities I will show you, I'm going to estimate from above. OK, so I'll go to the left, OK, which is good, right? Because then I will show you that this estimation, the upper bound of this from the left, will be lower than, than this one, OK, so it's, it, which is impossible. So that would, it would indicate violation. You know, this indicates violation, sorry. All right, so uh, I do this estimation, OK? And now, you know, what we did, we did not do experiment for that. We did experiment for similar things, but in a, only with two settings. With three settings, we did not do experiment yet. But uh, if you generate uh, the strings on the Mathematica, OK, then we found a very simple Huffman code, all right, to basically do the compression. And it's not optimal code. I don't claim that, but we, I don't need this. As long as I do, as I obtain violation, that's, that's good enough, right? So I do this Huffman code in such a way that I take two strings and I 
uh, concatenate them. And uh, then one of the strings is left aside. By the way, I didn't mention this, but of course, this compression is uh, reversible, right? So uh, it's lossless, right? I, it's not a, a lossy compression. So if I concatenate them, which is the symbol plus B here, then I still have the, the, the other string, of which we know is incompressible because it comes from random uh, discharges, right? Of, I mean, the, the random uh, outcomes. So th therefore, you, you get this N here because compression is equal to the length of the string. Okay, but that's good enough because I can compress this because they are correlated, right? Singlet has correlations. So definitely, I will obtain some compression rate that is uh, better than one, okay? So as I said, I use signal correlations, and then, you know, uh, because of this equidistance of measurements on, uh, that I perform, right, then uh, this NID is estimated from above by compression, uh, the, the length of the, of, of the concatenated compressed string divided by n, when n is the number of uh, measurements I perform, okay? You look like worried. Is it time or, no, no, no. or bullshit I'm saying? <laughs> That's all good. Okay. <laughs> so, And of course, uh, you know, I estimated this from above, so therefore I have five times r, which is this compression rate here, must be greater or equal to one, right? That, that's what, what would be if you had universal Turing machines correlated in space, right? And now, you know, on Mathematica, we just did some rounds of this Huffman code, as many as we needed. And we got the compression rate 0 0.192, which is not the best, okay? You, if you compare it with the Shannon, it's quite far away, but it's good enough. And then you plug it in, so five times this is 0 0.96, which is, of course, less than one, so you have violation, right? And so indirectly, we showed that if you were able to calculate those uh, uh, algorithmic entropies, you would have violation too, right? Because we, we did some worse, and it violates. <coughs> Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. But I, but, I, but I could test it, right? I mean, yeah, I could test it, yeah. Uh, actually, maybe maybe not, actually, because uh, that w it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be one, right? It would be something else, probably. No, 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 it should, it should be testable, I think. But I cannot, of course, this one I cannot estimate from above, right? Because I would go in the wrong direction, yeah, so. But I would say that if you go to the lab and you look at these orthogonal measurements and you collect million, million of clicks, right, and then you run all possible compression algorithms and you get very, very weak compression rates, then I would say it's pr proven. <laughs> uh, with the gun, it's all easy to prove, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so, okay, so we have violation. And... Uh, yeah, and then, so you can ask me the question, why, why did I do, why, okay. Um, well, why, because I told you, right, that you cannot, so this test, as I see it, right, it's a direct test of the existence of uh, non-contextual hidden variables, okay, and this test does not require assumption about some probability distribution over those variables, okay. So it is something in between Koch and Specker, piece of paper, proof, uh, uh, proof on the piece of paper, and real bell inequalities, right, that require statistics, okay? So something in between. I don't completely understand this, that's why there are some open questions, right, and, and problems that I would like to tackle in the future, if I have still funding for that. <coughs> so, uh, so yes, so the uh, remark is that this is a direct test of uh, non-contextual hidden variables, right, without any uh, additional assumptions, okay? Well, modulo all the counterfactual reasoning, which is actually allowed, right, in this kind of games. Now, this automatically applies to non-IID sources, right? But inequalities do not automatically apply to non-IID sources, right? They were modified by Richard Gill, right, and he showed that uh, they're okay, but this one does not need any proof. It's just compression doesn't care whether there was IID or non-IID, right? You just, you compress, and if you get the compression rate, you plug it to inequality, and you're happy, right? So that's a good thing, right? Because the Richard Gill paper is quite complicated if you, th if you read it, right? Now, this violation means that, you know, I, uh, strictly mathematically speaking, right, is either 
uh, or maybe you, you know what, because I use this uniform complexity here, uh, which is some assumption I made, so forget it, it's not important, okay? Well, I can explain this later, it's just quite boring. Uh, so as I said, we don't know how to apply to a single uh, system scenario, so we don't know how to go to the lab and take spin one particle and do the same kind of compressions and get some violation. We don't know, we haven't, I mean we have some ideas, but we haven't done it yet, right? And, and may, they may not work in the end. And now it would be very interesting to see because you see all this comes from, uh, all these things come from the Schumacher paper when he used the geometric distance between uh, probabilities, right, to, to deliver, uh, to de derive bell inequalities, and it's a very powerful tool. You can derive all of them, many of them actually. Okay? And uh, so I wonder whether this kind of uh, things can be applied to, for instance, quantum steering when you have this mixture of classical quantum, right? Then I don't know how to handle this, but maybe there, and I'm speculating widely, maybe in steering, you know, you have to mix uh, quantum algorithmic entropy with classical, okay? Maybe. That would be very interesting to, to explore this, okay? And that's interesting because recently I got a postdoc who did his PhD on quantum steering, <laughs> so I'm going to use him for that. Now, maybe, you know, I, don't, I haven't seen security proof of quantum cryptography using, uh, using uh, algorithmic complexity, but I did see classical proofs that use uh, these notions, right? Uh, now, of course, self-testing and uh, all these things that relate to bell inequality, right? Can they be formulated in this language? Okay. For the heck of it, maybe it's not interesting, but why not? And, of course, now you will see Adam's talk, right? And uh, as I said, all these uh, distances, right, where I, I read about them in a Zurek paper, and then he used this to, to say some things about reversibility of, uh, of computation, okay? All right, so I don't see how, how this relates, but I hope it does, right? The inequality I showed you, right, maybe can be translated into a ratio of information in the hypothetical computer that calculates the outcomes for qubits and stuff like that. That would be cool, yeah, if possible. Do you have any postdocs that are free? Or? Okay. <laughs> and, and maybe this will lead to, you know, uh, maybe it can be related to quantum version of, of algorithmic complexity, which is not, I think, well defined, right? I think I know your paper and I know some other paper and they do not agree. <laughs> <I> agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. So that's, that's it. Yeah.